Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all very much for joining us. I hope that you enjoyed that digital art slideshow of work done from uh, by our upper school students. And then our acapella group, Major Minors, was the, the music that you heard during the, the slideshow. So we hope that you enjoyed that. My name is Jennifer Webb, and I am very happy to be the Director of Enrollment Management and Financial Aid here at Flint Hill. And I'm also very happy that all of you are joining us this morning to learn more about our upper school. In terms of what you can expect from this event today, you're going to hear from our headmaster, John Thomas, more about Flint Hill. You'll also hear from our division director, Don Page, and our assistant division director and academic dean, Debbie Ayers, more about the upper school specifically. And then we have a panel of upper school parents, students, and, and alum here that are really excited to share their experiences at Flint Hill with you and answer any questions that, that, that you might have. And finally, well, we are used to um, these events being muted. We don't want that to stop you from engaging. So um, please don't be shy about putting your, your questions in the chat, your comments in the chat. We do want to hear from you uh, today. Uh, feel free to leave your cameras on or off, whatever you are comfortable with there. Um, we have our colleagues here, um, our upper school officers and assistant director Lawrence South. Justin Fitzgerald and Julie Lewis, who will be monitoring the chat today. And then Lauren will be closing at the end, giving you next steps for the admission process. So at this point, I will go ahead and turn it over to our division or our <laughs> headmaster, John Thomas. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Jennifer. And it's great to see you all. Uh, here. Normally, if this was a live on-campus event, I would have been greeting you at the door and a chance to meet you that way. Uh, but just to give you an idea, you hear the term like headmaster and what is that? And I know this Flint Hill's got, you know, three divisions and two campuses and everything. Um, I'm kept uh, in track by a third grader who was overheard telling her aunt one day when they asked, so who was that nice man at the door? I said, oh, that's Mr. Thomas. He's our school's mascot. So realize we all take on different responsibilities. So we do have a mascot and it's a Husky and you'll hear more about that in a minute, but we use the Iditarod dog sled race as a metaphor for our educational journey. That some days it's gotta be just absolutely exciting and breathtaking and you're learning so much. And the next minute is probably the scariest, craziest thing you've ever done. And yet as being Huskies, being part of a dog sled race, you're doing it as a team that someone is always looking out for you. Uh, and we consider the faculty, the kids, the parents, we're all part of that team. So I think it's a wonderful way to, to look at our journey and do that. And I will tell you, I also am pleased that you're here because I know as parents and I've raised, my wife and I raised three boys, you've got big decisions to make because uh, as parents, I will tell you, I think the two major responsibilities in life are give your kids unconditional love and get them educated because time moves quickly and you want them to be prepared. And I'm glad with all the choices we have in this region of the country, you're looking at us and giving us a chance to do it because part of education is getting kids to think outside their comfort zones, begin to be problem solvers, learn how to be uh, creative, how to collaborate, all of those things. So Flint Hill is blessed to work with the kids in all of that because we are a very student-centered school and we have through lines that carry through, like being a Husky is a through line that goes from our youngest kids all the way through our upper school. Um, clearly the idea of our technology, our relationship with Apple being a one-to-one -one program, it goes all the way through. Um, clearly the idea of social emotional development and, and watching out for that, the idea of learning styles and learning differences and how do we help kids if that's suddenly discovered right while they're in the middle of an upper school experience, all of that is a through line, but one of the other big ones are our core values. So I've got a brief slideshow and I'm gonna talk fast and go through it because I don't wanna take up everybody else's time, but I'd love to show you that because at the core of everything we do is this sense of values, this sense of who we are, what kind of people we're gonna be. So I'm gonna cut my camera off. So you're looking at the slideshow and not at me. And I'm gonna try and do this. And Jennifer, I'll need your help just to make sure I actually yes. get there. Yep, it is showing the, the presentation coming up now. 
and now it's full screen. You're also on the screen. Okay, great. So I'm going to quickly kind of walk us through this. And that idea, as I told you, us being Huskies and everything, and on this uh, dog sled together, the idea is about blazing your trail, finding out where that's going to go and how to do it. And I will tell you, as I said, this school is all about how do we keep getting better? How do we make sure we're constantly getting creative, we're being innovative? And I will also tell you, we are playing for the long game. We're not just playing for what will they be like next year and whatever grade they're going to be and then the following grade. We're in college and all, all of that is important. But we're also playing for what will they be like when they're 35, when they're 45. So everything we do at Flint Hill is very intentional, deliberate, strategic, and heaven's sakes, in the midst of COVID that we're still all learning how to live with, you know, how do we make sure it's also safe? And how do we look at everything we do based on the idea of benefits? You know, what are the benefits of this kind of a, an educational experience? How do you make sure that you're teaching them, obviously, the basics, but how do you make sure that those are relevant and dynamic? because things are changing all the time. How do you make learning active? How do you make learning personal and meaningful? And while you're doing that as a school, how do you make sure you have your parents feeling like they are partners in this experience? And as I said, we are very student-centered and that whole idea of how do we grab them intellectually, but how do we make sure we, they know that they're being supported uh, through all of that? A lot of it comes down to building relationships and trying to make sure that the kids know that teachers are there and have their backs. And I will tell you one of the most popular times in the day for students are office hours. We used to call it extra help, interestingly enough, and a lot of kids didn't wanna to go to extra help because it implied maybe they needed help. We changed probably almost 10 years ago to the idea of office hours like colleges use it and boom, everybody goes to office hours. Now, as I said, one of the through lines that we're most uh, attended to are our core values. I will tell you, we also used to have four, honesty, respect, responsibility, and compassion. But then we realized going through a process that while we loved those and we, we followed them, they weren't active. And everything about Flint Hill is about momentum. It is about working together. It is constantly growing and learning with and from each other. So what we did was we took those four values and expanded them a little bit, made them more action oriented and actually added the, the last one. And so what I'm gonna do is walk you through these five values very quickly so you have some idea about why they're at the heart of this learning experience. I mean, that whole idea of respecting and valuing all equally, well, that clearly is critical because that informs who we are, what we do, um, and how you act and interact with others, all of it comes back to whether you respect the people, whether you value them, and clearly, how do you make sure that that links in together? Um, you know, we have a very strong program on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we have student groups. We have a parent book club. We have different activities uh, that we're constantly looking at, you know, because in our great school, we not only have different religions, different races, nationalities, um, We've even got flags. If you've looked at our website, you've seen the flags maybe on the wall in the upper school and in our uh, lower school. We've got over 115 nationalities represented in our school family. What a gift that is, a quiet gift we're giving our kids that they get to go to school with people from all over the world or whose families have come from all over the world. Well, that's a huge responsibility then to make sure that we utilize that. The idea of lead and support with compassion. How do we make sure that passion is much more important than pressure? There are a lot of schools you can visit. Great reputations, wonderful places, but 10 minutes in the building, you know it's a pressure cooker. Here, we take pride in saying we are not a pressure cooker. These kids are going to work hard. They're going to take a top flight academic program. They're involved in the arts. They're in competitive athletics. My gosh, you know, they're taking leadership opportunities, but it's all about passion. And then how do we make sure, even though we've got some kids who've been with us since they were in junior kindergarten or kindergarten or lower school or whatever, how do we make sure we are welcoming to new kids joining us? And we are. Our kids who've been with us the longest will tell you they love 
when new kids join the school, particularly when we have so many join us in say ninth grade, how do we make sure they become Huskies as quickly as possible? That's trying to make friends, how to help them get to know the school. How do we make sure that they get acclimated and feel part of our school family? And we do use the term school family much more than, than community. The idea of acting with integrity is, is another value. Um, and that's not just the idea of being honest. So I will tell you, when we raised our, our boys, honesty was key to everything we did. You know, we could understand kids doing stuff or whatever, but you better be honest with us when we when we ask you a question. Well, at Flint Hill, we absolutely talk about that idea of you're going to act with integrity. It's not just you're going to use that euphemism of I'm going to be honest. We're going to act with integrity. And we've done that throughout this entire COVID period. And I think we've also built uh, trust with our parents, our parent partners, because we've communicated so much. And in fact, I think at the baseline of everything we do is that I have the three key things, communicate, communicate, communicate. And the whole idea is making sure people have an idea of what in the world is going on. And we have done that so that we last year had kids on campus all year long, uh, but we were watching health protocols and everything else. But a lot of that is acting with integrity. How do we make sure we're safe, but we constantly are looking about what do we need to do? Imagining what's possible, well, that's taking that idea of responsibility that had been one of our older uh, core values and now making it action oriented, looking down the road. How do we keep growing? How do we make sure that we are constantly trying to, to get better and better? Because uh, when you do that, it makes all the difference in the world. It's because of that that we began to develop a relationship with Apple uh, years ago that truly has made a difference in our kids. So all of our students in the upper school have their own uh, laptop and you know, kids in our lower school are in iPads. Uh, the middle school is in laptops uh, next year as well. This year, they're actually using both because they've been a beta program for Apple. And Apple uses us as an Apple site school for the state of Virginia, that anybody in public or private schools who contacts Apple, they're encouraged to come visit Flint Hill. We were invited years ago to be part of a a group called uh, Inmax, which are 15 schools around the country uh, that you know get together and would, we're able to talk. The idea that we've got usually on average seven to eight kids get into the governor schools, which are a highly competitive summer program and all that. And then even trying to make sure that we are reaching out to colleges and universities all across the country to get ready for our students. Because as they leave us, they are going to blaze their trail. They are going to go to the next step. And we want them to be fully prepared. We want them to be confident and humbly competent in everything they're going to do. And clearly, as they go forward on that trail, you know, they will get involved in programs like our robotics program, just to use them as an example. And this year, we're going to be finally able to get back to it. While we've, we've done cybersecurity in the fall, we do regular uh, robotics, and we've been very competitive in that in the winter. The one I love is the unmanned aerial program, uh, which unfortunately, the last two years with COVID, we haven't been able to do. But three years ago, when we were able to do it the last time, I will just quickly tell you, 75 schools were invited to take part in this program. 71 of them were colleges and universities. Only four high schools in the world were invited, and we were one of them. They had to build a drone. It had to have a rover craft built underneath it so we could drop to Earth at some point during its trial. It had to go up 750 feet, which makes it invisible to the human eye. It had to fly over five miles. It had to go around obstacles had to do all that, as I said, drop the rover, all of that in 30 minutes. And when that competition, interestingly enough, was over, the engineering department at a university in Quebec won it for the second year in a row, but also for the second year in a row, Flint Hill came in second. And among the American schools that were behind us on the list, Harvard, Cornell, Stanford, UCLA, the US Naval Academy, Emory-Riddle University, and the year before that, the first time we came in second, Virginia Tech was in third place, which was great to have two Virginia schools in the top three. What I loved is the three leading engineering students at Virginia Tech were Flint Hill graduates who were trying to knock off their high school. Well, part of the idea is now to get to know our upper school, to get to know what's going on here. And I will tell you, let me try and 
turn this off. One of the great things about what we are able to do is we follow a vision. And the vision is very simple. Take meaningful risks, be yourself, and make a difference. And we encourage the kids to try things they've never tried. Step out of their comfort zone. Be themselves. Know that you're surrounded by people who care about you, but ultimately make a difference. And our graduates do in all the fields that they go into. It is an exciting, uh, I think, a place that the kids look forward to coming to school every day and the teachers look forward as well. So now I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Page, who's our director of the upper school. And I will tell you, at a lot of schools, going to see the, uh, the principal or the director, it's the last place anybody wants to go. Or people say, God, I don't want the director to even know my name. I want to go through school anonymously. Not so at Flint Hill. Kids love Mr. Page. They love the fact that he knows them. Kids go into his office not only to chat, but he's got a big puzzle kids are always working on. Lots of great things because of those relationships and building that bond between the adults at school and the students. So, Don, I'm going to flip it to you now, and I'll stop talking because people know I'll just keep going if given the chance, and that's not a fair thing to everybody. All right, take care. Thanks for joining Thanks. us, Don. Thanks, John, and thank you for, for the kind words. It is true when John comes by, most times there's a student in here, or sometimes a student will come by, and John goes, nope, nope, I'll I'll leave you, you this is more important you, you go talk to mr page so uh, um as as john said my name is don page i'm the director of the upper school and i was in the same situation you were uh last year this is my first year here at flint hill and i brought my family uh to this community as well and so i i was looking to the same things that you were looking into last year um and you can look at everyone's core values and their ideas on a website but you want to make sure that they're actually being uh, um, used at the school and being taught at the school. And so, and we take these really seriously and our mission really seriously. And so one of the first things I wanted to know is how was I going to be part of the process of e evincing these statements, um, creating kind of a judicious and real thoughtful plan to engender and nurture that kind of culture, uh, um, to make people take meaningful risks, to have people show respect to each other, to be an inclusive place. And so that's why when we start our school year, we have a really extensive orientation with multiple segments that are either held in advisory, uh, some are held in class meetings, school-wide meetings. Um, and having this been my first year, it was kind of like my orientation as well, and it helped a, a, a great deal. And I'm already looking forward to planning next year's. If you walked on campus during that week and your child was going through that orientation, you'd see a multitude of activities ranging from the pragmatic mundane to the socially complicated gathering. You'd see advisors going over the student's schedule with them, making sure they understand where they're going, where the classrooms are, uh, when they need to be there. Uh, you would have seen sessions on the drop ad period, uh, key behavioral expectations, textbook usage, but you'd see those at any school in August. Um, what I think what makes Flint Hill unique, what makes us unique are the deeper activities that are utilized during that week to build community among the students, uh, students that are both new and students that are returning. So whether a student's been here since they were in JK or they're new to campus, we want them to go through that process again to embed themselves in that culture. So we know that when we were playing field games with the juniors and sophomores on the field, we knew it would yield better conversations down the road in a STEAM class where maybe they were both in that class together. We knew that when the athletic council sit down each grade in the gym to go over these key Husky cheers that we do with sporting events, this would result in more students traveling to Potomac for the first basketball game or coming to tip off and feeling like they can be a part of the student section and feel like they have a group that they're already with. And when we match up seniors with freshmen during the week and have them play games such as Pictionary, we're really beginning the process of turning the seniors into mentors on campus. You know, the older students are the culture carriers of the campus and having those conversations by them out in the community in the hallways really is what embeds that culture. And the seminal moment of the week is when every student and faculty staff member signs our core values board, which is put in the main hallway of the upper school building. And you'd see roughly 700 signatures on there that serve as a daily reminder of that pledge. We all walk in through that front door and walk by that every day to remind ourselves of how we've pledged to be part of this community and how we're going to act. 
And we think the result of all this intentional and strategic work is the supportive community you'll notice when and if you ever get the stamp on campus. It goes beyond just creating a safe place for students to learn, but it also allows students to think about taking a meaningful risk, knowing that we learn through failing and we grow through experimenting. It's hard to blaze your own trail and imagine what if in a community uh, that doesn't support these risks and innovations. Um, it can be simple as the experience my own daughter had. When we came from Florida, she was theater all the way and no sports shall she ever play. Um, she used to say, I don't know, I don't do that, Dad. Um, and since she's got here, she tried volleyball, she's tried softball, and she's really embraced those. And from the moment she stepped on the court, none of the coaches or players cared that she had never done this before. They just cared that she was trying something new. And now every afternoon, you'll see her bumping a volleyball against the side of the house or asking me, well, I pitched her why she wants to catch. It, it's just changed her. And, and she wouldn't have done that without a safe environment to do that in. And this nurturing and support stays with them throughout their time at Flint Hill and gets capped off by a senior project where the students pick an important topic to explore in great depth over about 50 hours. So before we graduate them off in the world, we send them out in a mini exploration to pursue something they care deeply about. And our seniors right now are off on those trips. I'm mentoring seniors that are looking at environmental regulations in New York City or what it is to be a dermatologist in the local area. And as part of doing this, they had to call offices, ask to shadow, get turned down with things. They, they learn to kind of accept no so they can be persistent and go through with a project. Um, so it's the ultimate moment for them of blazing your own trail and being yourself. And each senior picks their own project. And we're really proud of them. And they're going to start doing their presentations here in the next couple of weeks. But before we can get your children to that point, we need to discuss our deep, broad, and really rich curriculum. And to go through the major points of that curriculum, we have Debbie Ayers, who's the assistant director of the upper school and the upper school academic dean who's going to walk you through some of those components. So I'll turn it over to Debbie now. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. Uh, like John said, my name is Debbie Ayers. I'm the assistant director of the upper school and the academic dean. And it is um, a pleasure to be able to welcome you to this virtual meeting today to give you just a snippet of, of what we offer in terms of uh, our academic program. It is a rich blend of traditional and contemporary education. And we develop our program across eight academic departments. And those departments include English, history, social sciences, math, science. We have classic uh, for our Latin and Greek uh, learners. We have modern languages that include both French and Spanish. We have a fine arts department and we have an innovation department. So students across their four years here or if they come in as a sophomore or junior, um, not four years, but three or two, they will take courses if they would like in all of those departments. We have a requirement of 20 credits for graduation. So that would um, balance out a schedule of five courses per year. Most students will take five or six. And uh, we have opportunities to really personalize their academic program while they're here. So students can excel in the arts while they're uh, learning more about the sciences. Some students might take two languages, others might take two sciences while they're here. So everybody's path can be a little bit different based on their their interest levels and their passions, but we also hope they'll try something new. Uh, it is a vast curriculum with so many choices, and so it is oftentimes that students will join us early and have one idea of what they like and what their passion area might be, and by the time they graduate here, they could have ventured into a whole new um, avenue. So we love to support those uh, exciting changes as they are here in high school and really nurture their growth and experiences. Um, I want to take some time to introduce you to a few guests we have today who will also be able to share about uh, the academic experience from their lens as parents. And we have some students here that can tell you firsthand what it's like to be in our classrooms. Um, I will allow them to introduce themselves. We'll start with our parents. We have three parents here. And Sabelle, I will start with you and then Sabelle to Mary, and then to Terang, and then uh, we'll go to our students. So, Sabelle, if you will just come on board and let us know who you are and what your roles are here and um, maybe something about your student. 
Great. Um, my name is Sibel Ansel, and I am the current Parents Association president. I also coordinate all the parent volunteers. Um, we have been here for 13 years, so my son is a lifer. He is a current senior, and he will be heading to college in the fall. So, thanks. Mary, we're not hearing you. It could be your microphone. Sorry. <laughs> Mary Byer. Uh, my son, Max, is in the 10th grade, rising junior next year, and we came to Flint Hill in ninth grade. And Terang. Hi, everybody. I'm Terang Nazari. My daughter is Artemis Marsban. We joined Flint Hill um, this year for ninth grade, and Artie was previously at Westminster for K through eight. Nice to meet everyone. Thank you. And I'd like for our students, and we have, we're welcoming home uh, one of our alums. So, Devin, we'll start with you and then Soliana and then Grace, if you're on now. We just had class change. So, um, the other two may be coming on for in just a second. So, Devin, hello. Welcome back. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, I'm sorry if my connection is a little bit unstable. I'm in a tiny island, tiny island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So uh, the wonders of Internet and satellite Internet. So uh, apologies if I cut in and out. Um, but my name is Devin. Uh, I've, uh, I graduated in uh, class 2020. So I'm a rising junior at the University of Michigan um, Ross School of Business. So uh, my, my just starting my third year there in the fall. Um, it, I graduated in 2020. I have a younger brother, Grant, who's currently a senior, so I'm still attached to the school quite a bit. Um, and I, I did, um, was captain of the robotics team uh, for two years. I played basketball for all four years of high school, uh, president of the cybersecurity club. Um, anything innovation related, I was a part of it essentially. So if you have any of those types of questions, shoot them my direction. I'm happy to, happy to answer them. Thank you. Soli, good morning. Hi, I'm Soli or Soliana. I'm a current senior at Flint Hill. Next year, I'll be attending Dickinson College. But prior to that, I was at Westminster School. And yeah, I've been attending Flint Hill since freshman year. And I was a part of lots of things, more humanities related. I'm more into English and history. But yeah, that pretty much sums it up. Thank you, Soli. Grace, good morning. Hi, I'm Grace Semko. I'm a ninth grader here and I just started going to Flint Hill. I came from Cooper Middle School in Fairfax County and I play junior varsity volleyball and varsity basketball and I'm involved in the Academic Honor Council. Thank you so much. So parents, I'm going to start off with a question um, for you to answer. And then with any of our guests would like to enter questions in on the chat, you can do that. Also, you can come off your mic and ask a question. I'll just get us started this morning um, with a basic question that I think um, many new families would be interested in hearing from our parents. How does Flint Hill work with new students and new families to bring you on board to help you connect and transition to your new school home? Terang? Um, so basically we, you know, we had a great transition. Um, Artie has really developed a wonderful group of friends at the school and um, for us, it was a little bit easier, I guess, coming from Westminster, where there are a lot of Westminster kids already at Flynn Hill. And with Artie's class, I think there were probably um, two other um, classmates of hers from uh, Westminster that joined in the ninth grade. Additionally, we were very lucky. One of the parents um, reached out to us in uh, early August and set up a coffee for a few of the incoming ladies um, into ninth grade. And so we were able to actually make connections before school even started. So um, I think the transition for us has been great. So I'll jump in. Um, so Max came, my son came in from Fairfax County Public Schools and he came in in ninth grade during the height of COVID. Um, and despite that, right, um, it was a good transition for him because I think the most important thing is the teachers have these kids, right? They are not just teaching the class, but they know who they have. They know how they're coming in and matriculating in the school. And they kind of 
quickly assess what they need. And so um, because from time to time they were home because of close contact or remote learning, I would get to hear a lot of what went on with the teachers. And the teachers were very interactive with Max and he loved it. So it was a really um, probably one of the toughest times to transition, um, but Flint Hill made it much easier for him. Students, would any of you like to add on to that? What are the first uh, weeks of school like? Soli? So when I joined Flint Hill first, I, I have a sister and she's one grade above me. And the first thing that she told me was play a fall sport. And then I was like, okay, because I'm not really into sports. Like I'm not a big sports person. And I played volleyball and I would 110% recommend playing a fall sport because one, there's preseason. So you're going to meet a few other people and get to know a lot of people. And it makes the transition a lot easier. And I met some of my closest friends doing that. And then off of their friends, because some people, they came from Flint Hill. So I got to meet a lot of people and it branched off after that. And another thing after that, there is like, there's, I don't know if they're still doing this, but there's like these events that happen outside of school and they could be outdoors or at Flint Hill and it's right when school starts. So again, it's a perfect time to meet people and it really makes the transition easier. And there are several other things that Flint Hill does to kind of ease your way into Flint Hill. It's not only easing your way to Flint Hill, it's easing the people who are coming from the lower school or the middle school, their way to having a, like half the grade you know, it's, their old grade is being doubled. And these little activities that happen before classes actually start allow you to make like connections that make you feel more comfortable, more at ease within the environment of Flint Hill. Because I think one of Flint Hill's main things is that every student feels comfortable there. There's always a friendly and familiar face. And these activities are kind of like a highlight of that. Thank you. Uh, Devin, um let me ask you this. Uh, what are some of the takeaway lessons from Flint Hill or your experiences that you had in high school? How is, has that bridged over to successes and, um, you know, decisions that you're making in college now? What were some of the takeaways from your high school education that have supported you in college? Sure. And we talked a lot about this in my time at Flint Hill is the idea of taking meaningful risks, right? Um, and being comfortable being uncomfortable, right? Um, so I, I I was the type of person who tried to do it all per se. I tried to do as much as I could at Flint Hill and take on a lot of new challenges that I wouldn't necessarily have associated my, myself with previously, right? Um, the idea of playing a fall sport, right? Um, even, even though basketball's in the winter, we had summer workouts the summer before my freshman year, right? Um, so I had the opportunity to meet juniors and seniors and be friends with them right before I even stepped foot on campus, essentially. Um, there's a, the story of my high school career really was developing not only my leadership skills, right? So the idea of me being able to um, interact with various groups of individuals, right, from across all spectrums of the uh, academic center to the um, sports center as well. But um, really putting myself out there and, and um, taking on a lot of responsibilities across different areas has really well for a lot of the experiences that I, I um, have now in college and then will eventually have as I look forward to my, my career in the working world. Thank you. Uh, Sabelle, how might our parents find a way to be connected on campus too? Are there lots of opportunities for new families to get to know one another? Yes, I mean, I think that during the summer before your student starts, we have our Husky Hello team reach out to kind of connect you um, and get you excited. And then also I'm at school right now, I'm in the upper school, um, about to volunteer at the Igloo. And that's our concession stand and we're open twice a day, every day. Um, and I really encourage new families to do that as well. Tons of opportunities. That's great. So our guests, are there any particular questions that you have for our panelists? Hi. Oh, am I supposed to raise my hand? Sorry. No, you're fine. Please okay. go ahead. Okay. Um, I wanted to know, um, it was mentioned, um, I, I believe it was Soliana that mentioned about um, sometimes there's um, there are some events before school starts 
Um, I love the idea of recommending um, my daughter to back up a second, actually, she's going to be transferring in as a sophomore. Um, so has a year already under her belt and she loves sports. Um, so I love the idea of definitely uh, encouraging her, which I know she will, <laughs> to try out for a fall sport. Um, but also you mentioned um, that there are some activities and maybe some things over the summer, um, just some ways that she might be able to meet some new transitioning students as well as current students. Um, so if you have any other, if anyone has any other insight on that, I don't know, I'm assuming is it like some kind of social or picnic or some something that's organized at the school? Because um, I, I do think that that would be helpful as well. Thank you. Yeah, so I I came in as a freshman and I remember one one specific activity that we had was an ice cream social. And it was a bunch of like newly admitted students just gathered outside with some ice cream. And they're kind of just like, they play some music, I remember, from what I remembered, and they had some ambassadors there, so that's what I do, to kind of get everybody feeling, like, warm and ready to talk, asking questions, and it's more of, like, a nice casual event for people to meet each other, so that's one thing I remembered, and then there was also, I don't know if they're doing this because of any more, but there's Kaleva, I think they've transitioned it to, at school, so Kaleva was this event, like, where students would go outside, and it was, like, you could go kayaking, rowboating, many, like, outdoorsy type activities, but I think now they transitioned that to at school due to COVID reasons. And it was kind of during orientation week. There's a lot of less academic events that allow students to kind of form, you know, friendship bonds rather than in class bonds. I'll, can I, I'll briefly touch on this because that was a great explanation. But one of my greatest fears coming in is um, I, I came from small and middle school called Nysmith in Herndon, uh, where I was a group about 50 kids. Um, my, one of my greatest fears coming to Flint Hill was, you know, there's a set group already coming up from middle school. They'll all know each other. I'm going to have a hard time making friends, um, breaking into the, the social groups of Flint Hill, so to speak. Um, but Flint Hill recognizes this entirely, right? Um, so one of the, one of the best things that they do is they, they take you out of the classroom settings for that first week. They, they, they put everyone in uncomfortable situations, whether that's on a kayak or on a sailboat down the Potomac, like I was with a group of my friends. Um, so there's really, they do a great job of, um, introducing everyone and putting everyone on a level playing field, so to speak for that first week, so that everyone has the opportunity to meet new friends, um, meet new individuals and really create those connections for the first time. Grace, would you like to also add a comment about, um, your participation in sports as well as on the Academic Honor Council as a way to connect with, um, fellow peers? Yeah, so like some of the other panelists have mentioned, playing a fall sport is very helpful. I tried out for volleyball last fall, and I actually, since tryouts start a week before the school year actually starts, I got to meet a lot of upperclassmen and lowerclassmen, and I already had, like, a set of friends before I even stepped in the building. And even if you don't have an opportunity to try out for fall sports when the school year actually starts, you have a lot of time in advisory and the people you meet in your advisory um, become some of your friends because you're spending a lot of time with them during the school year. And then on the Academic Honor Council, throughout the year, you have opportunities to volunteer for student leadership opportunities. And there are many different councils you can, um, um, what's the word, get elected for or put your name down for. So there's junior ambassadors, academic honor council, athletic um, student council, and many more. And when you're on it, there are upperclassmen and lowerclassmen. And it's also like a great way to connect with the community and people who have the same interests as you. Great, thank you. We have um, a question coming from Sherilyn. Would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Now, Sherilyn, you have your hand up. Okay, well, we will move on. There's a question in the chat. Are there AP credits? Yes. We have 25 AP courses here, as well as um, our, a rich assortment of regular and honors classes, too. So students will have an opportunity if they wish to try an AP during their time at Flint Hill. 
Uh, let's see here. Students, uh, would you be able, well, Devin, I guess this one will be for you. Um, senior projects. Can you tell us a little bit about what you did for a senior project and what that process is like? Yeah, so I worked at a, a company we have a great relationship with uh, as a uh, as an institution um, called Design Technologies. So as everything innovation uh, based, um, and I'm sure you guys might have had the opportunity to see some of our drone related activities on campus, uh, who my brother is currently a part of. Um, I had the opportunity to work at a um, Design Technologies, a, de a defense contractor out in um, Tyson's um, so they did a lot of uh, projects with DARPA, defense and advanced research projects. So I was, I was assigned to a project for that. And then they liked me so much during my senior project that they kept me on for the summer. So um, I, I had the opportunity to do a lot of really, really cool, exciting, uh, kind of cutting edge drone stuff that was um, a bit above the normal high schoolers pay grade, so to speak. But uh, Flint Hill kids, they love us because we are working on the um, same types of, of drone technologies that they are. So um, there's there's amazing opportunities and Flint Hill has really built these great relationships with a lot of these companies over the years that sort of have a pipeline essentially where you're able to have um, these amazing opportunities as, as a high school senior that a lot of college uh, students would struggle to get. So, so it's an amazing opportunity. Can I elaborate on this because I'm currently doing my senior project? Oh yes, Soli, thank you. Yes, please. Okay. so. Again, after COVID, a lot of things have shifted. So senior projects became less, even though some people still do internships, they've become less internship-based and more student-based. So students kind of base them on their own interests. For example, myself, like I'm more interested in like law and humanities. So I'm starting a podcast kind of regarding different matters regarding litig litigation. And one of my plans for my podcast is like to talk about like these Virginia House legis legislature bills that are currently being passed. And my friend who's doing a blog on Virginia House legislation, legislation bills. And it's kind of because after COVID, you kind of have to take these senior projects into your own hands and students use this as a way to kind of delve into their own interests that they plan on, you know, delving into even more in college. Like because me, I'm studying law. I was like, okay, what's something like I could put on my resume, something that shows I can do independent research while still working with other people to kind of show that, you know, self-work plus like teamsmanship kind of like skills. And yeah, that's what I feel like these senior projects have become more based. But then again, I know people who are also working in a doctor's office to literally working on a farm because they're interested in environmental sciences and you know helping the environment to people who are working with a community service organization with making bracelets out of like recycled material. So I feel like the concept of Flint Hill senior projects have kind of evolved due to COVID. Great. Thank you so much for, for those responses about senior projects. Uh, parents, could I direct this question to you? As students are coming in and making their decisions about courses, how, um, how did that process go from your lens? How is course selection, um, how do we connect with families to help choose courses for students that are coming in to Flint Hill? So, so I'll take that. Um, so first of all, the, the my son was heavily involved with um, your office, Debbie, as well as um, other people in the academic office to pick when he came into ninth grade. But the minute they get into ninth grade, right, they are so involved with their advisors and their teachers that they start to have a trajectory to what I call the core courses, like the histories, the math, the sciences. And then they really get to explore kind of these electives. So my son is more of a humanities kid. He likes the humanities. He likes the social sciences. So he stepped out of kind of his fine arts, like love of fine arts and, and broadened himself a little bit and um, is taking a, a financial mathematics class, just more of a business math class next year. He took um, economics, intro to economics last year, which he loved, right? Talks about it all the time, educates me all the time on the law of supply and demand. So um, they have a lot of support and the school really looks to the, the child or the, the student in what are they really interested in and what do they love to do and gives them a chance to explore. And I think at the very beginning, um, Debbie Ayer said this very important thing. A, a kid might think they have one passion and then when they start to explore other things 
and they start to touch other things that they wouldn't get in a, a more traditional school, they really start to um, broaden themselves and start to look outside of the confines of the traditional path. So I think it's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I do see a question also related to courses about um, middle school transition to upper school and whether credits need to be repeated. Not necessarily at all. Um, we want to meet the students where they are instructionally and just transition that skill development so it's seamless, so it just keeps going. Um, students will take placement surveys in the spring before they begin in the fall. And those placement surveys give us an idea of where they are instructionally. What, what is the skill set that they're bringing forward to high school? And then we match that to the course that picks right up and continues that growth. So students um, coming into ninth grade will not all be in the same courses. There are some classes that all of them will take, but we have different levels for many of them. And, and so it is personalized in that way as well as there will be an element of choice. Students can decide which of the art courses they want um, from ceramics. We have digital arts. Uh, we have performing arts, many opportunities for them to explore a new art, as well as innovation. If they want to come in and begin with Robotics One or computer science, we have lots of entry points for our ninth graders to, to take a look at. Um, so I hope that that answers the question about whether or not you repeat things. Not necessarily. Sometimes a student might come in and feel like it would be in their best interest to, to repeat a language because uh, instruction is different from one school to the next. But really, we, we want to work with them after we have the placement survey to find that sweet spot where it, there's a challenge that's appropriate. It's not overwhelming, but it does continue their growth um, through the curriculum that they're, they're studying. Um, let's see, I'm going to review these chat questions and see if I can offer another. Um, how about the advisory program? Uh, students or parents? Could you give our families just an idea of how advisory works and the benefits of having that small group within a larger school? Um, I can speak on this for a second. <clears throat> so the way advisory work, <clears throat> sorry guys. The way advisory works at Flint Hill is that freshman year, you're assigned to an advisory. So you meet your advisor, you meet the advisees there. It's a small group, probably about 10 to 15 people-ish. And you spend a lot of time with them. You don't go a day without seeing them. And you see them in the mornings and a majority of days, you're gonna see them for like an hour throughout that day. And it really builds like a connection because advisory acts as like a safe space for not only your fellow advisees, but with your advisor. Your advisor is somebody who you would look up to as a mentor. If you need advice, whether it's academic, athletic, social, anything, your advisor will be there for you. But then towards the end of your freshman year, you can meet this like wide selection of advi possible advisors. They'll come, they'll talk about their self, themselves, what they teach, what their interests are, what their goals, goals will be during advisory. And then based on your own personal interests and what you want to gain out of advisory, you get to like rank these advisors out of a list based on what you want. And then um, based on these like rankings, the school will look at them and then assign advisors to advisees. And then based on who you get, you're stuck with them for 10th through 12th grade. And this long period of time, and again, as I mentioned before, you spend a lot of time with advisory, you build like a true connection, a very authentic connection with your fellow advisees in the sense that every morning you're seeing each other. And then with your advisor, this extended period of time like allows you to grow with them and for them to act as like kind of like the water to your plant essentially because they want to see you become the best version of yourself, whether it's socially, academically, athletically, whatever whatever challenges you're facing, whatever obstacles you're facing, the advisor will be there for you and will act as like a, an administrator's or like a teacher's voice at the school for you. Because sometimes as a student, you don't know exactly what you're doing. You don't know exactly where to go, who to go to. But the one thing that's kind of for certain is that you'll always have your advisor there. And that's, it's always good to have that kind of role model in your life throughout these like challenging years of high school. 
Thank you, Soli. Grace, would you like to add to that? Yeah, just to add on as well, I feel like a big difference between public school and Flint Hill is that your advisor really does like care about each and every one of um, their advisees. And like throughout the quarters, we'll have grade checks and they'll like check in with you, make sure you're like being the best you can be, making sure that if there's anything you need to be successful, that they can like provide it for you. And if they're, you're having a, an issue at school, whether it be social, academic, or anything in between, they're always there to help. Thank you so much. Parents, do you have um, opportunities to interact with the student's advisor too? Um, I have not um, <clears throat> had the opportunity outside of, I think, just the parent-teacher conferences or conversations that were initiated by them. Um, I know Artie really enjoys her advisory um, period and um, seems to be kind of like the starting point for her day. So if that goes well, then the rest of the day goes well. As <laughs> yeah, so I have, um, and Max's advisor really helped him this year in a couple of areas, one of which was kind of figuring out that course selection going into junior year because it's it's a pivotal year, right? And, and working through with him, you know, what he, what he wanted to do and kind of looking at it holistically across the board to make sure that how he was laying out these classes, you know, he could handle the pace and the, and the pressure because, you know, he had lofty um, ambitions, which is great, but you want to make sure that the child is socially and academically capable of um, hitting that. So she's been fantastic. Thank you. Uh, David's question, what happens if a student is having an issue, grades are slipping or unfocused? How does the Flint Hill advisor help work with them to get them back on track? Would anyone like to respond to that? I can respond to that. So I would say the advisor, because the advisory is so small, they always have an opportunity to check up on their students. So when they see a grade slipping, first thing they're going to do is contact the student. So they're going to be like, hey, what's going on? Like, is there anything you need help with? Maybe some extra assistance. And then if measures aren't taken from there, this, the advisor will start, you know, CCing parents and um, emailing teachers because the advisor isn't working against you. They're working for you. So they're, they're going to proceed to take the steps necessary to be like, hey, what's going on? And what are the steps that maybe I can take to guarantee that this student doesn't remain unfocused and these grades don't remain dropping. So once teachers and parents are CC'd, things tend to be fixed from that point on. But then if things aren't fixed from that point on, then higher ups like Miss Ayers or Miss Chialanzio or whoever like the, um, the dean for the grade is because there's different deans per grade, they'll start to be emailed. And then um, there are office hours that like advisors can set up a meeting between a teacher and a student to make sure that the student has the help they need to succeed because not only is the advisor working for you, the teachers are working for you and the administration is working for you. And then as like a collective, they come together to be like, okay, how can we help this student? Because obviously they're struggling. That makes sense if that answers the question. Thank you so much. And I just wanna take a moment here. I, I think we've come to the end of our time for this portion of the presentation today. I'm going to turn it back over to our admissions uh, group, but I just want to say thank you so much to the parents who gave some of their time this morning and our students and Devin from your little island in the Atlantic. Thank you so much for, for tuning in this morning. I appreciate your help and the responses to the questions. Um, so, if there are any other questions that we could not address during this time, please know that we have them in the chat. If you want to ask more, you can continue to feed into the chat, but I will turn it back over to Lauren South now to answer questions about the admission process. Hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Mrs. Ayers, and thank you to all of our panelists, our wonderful parents, and our student ambassadors, and former student ambassador, Devin, I told you on your commencement day that we would get you. Your work uh, selling Flint Hill was not done, so um, we really appreciate you spending the time, especially, um, yeah, given your location right now. So, and um, Soli and Grace um, and our parents, uh, panelists, thank you again. 
for your time. So um, I am going to present my screen now and just quickly walk through our admission process. Um, Mr. Fitzgerald and Mrs. Lewis, if someone could let me know um, when my screen is up. Yep, you're up. But okay. Perfect. Oh, oh, great. Okay. Actually. One second. Go back here. Let me try this again. Sorry. There we go. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Wonderful. So um, the admission process here at Flint Hill is really about getting to know each other. We, we truly approach it, um, you know, the Flint Hill way uh, with transparent dialogue throughout the experience with the mission and student uh, truly being at the center. Um, we, we ask that families bring their authentic selves, as will we, um, so that we can make the best decisions for each student together. We want to make the process as low stress as possible. Um, and we're really here to serve as guides um, for you all throughout the admission process. So what is required to apply? Um, so the first step um, in the application process is to complete the application form. It takes about 20 minutes and mostly you're inputting contact information. Um, and so you will complete that through our community portal, the Husky Hub, which is what um, prospective families um, will use on the admission side. Um, and then if you become an enrolled family, then you will use it um, as a current parent and your students will use it uh, as well to access um, information, uh, communicate with teachers and all of that. Um, so once you uh, submit the application form, you will see uh, a checklist for your student in the Husky Hub with a list of our required supporting materials. Um, so the first uh, is an official transcript or progress report from your student's current school. Um, so we are often asked um, how far back uh, do you, should you go? Uh, we don't need your, your children's transcripts from you know, elementary school, certainly if they're applying to uh, ninth or, or 10th or 11th grade, but um, if you could submit the grades from the previous year, um, and then whatever um, you know is, is the most recent progress report from their current school year. So if they are going into eighth grade next year um, and you are you know, requesting the transcript um, you know, in the middle of the fall, maybe we will get the first quarter and then we'll ask for the uh, first semester um, at the time of the admission um, application deadline in January. Of course, if they enroll, then we will want to see those, um, those final grades for their eighth grade year or, or ninth grade or 10th grade if they're applying to um, higher grades uh, here at Flint Hill. Um, we also require two uh, letters of recommendation, one from a math teacher and one from an English teacher. Um, so again, our portal is, is very easy to navigate. You can request um, these recommendation letters right through the Husky Hub. You'll just input the teacher's name and um, email address, and then they will um, receive the request in their inbox um, and complete the form in their own time and then submit those um, right back to us. And when we receive them, you will see a check mark next to that, um, next to that line on your student's checklist in the Husky Hub. Questionnaires. So we have uh, two different questionnaires, one for the parent um, or parents to complete together and one for the candidate. So the student. Um, these are short answer questions asking you all to kind of reflect on, on um, you know, your student's experience or, or their experience, um, kind of what they're looking for in their next school community. Um, and just, you know, an opportunity to share a little bit more about themselves prior to the interview. We ask these um, that these be submitted before the interview takes place. We also require a graded writing sample. So we want to see um, a sample of um, your students writing um, and then also how they were evaluated from a, a, by a teacher. So, um, you know, we ask that there be some evaluative component included, whether it be a letter grade or teacher comments or a rubric that's attached. Um, we're pretty flexible um, with what's submitted. Again, you know, I think the, the goal is, is to see um, you know, piece of work and then, you know, also, you know, how the teacher is 
is responding to that work. Um, in terms of uh, standardized tests, we have moved um, to a, a test optional uh, status here at Flint Hill for the upper school uh, application process, which means that if your student has taken um, the SSAT, which is the secondary school admission test, or another standardized test, um, perhaps for a, a different program they're applying to, um, we will certainly accept those scores and include them in our evaluation, include them in their admission file, um, but we do not require them. Um, so it is completely up to you all as a family to decide whether or not to submit um, test scores. It will not be held against them if they don't. Um, if they do, we'd be happy to include those in their file. Um, and lastly is the uh, parent or guardian and student interview. Um, so I alluded, this, um, alluded to this earlier on. Um, we do require that the questionnaires be submitted prior to the interview taking place, but we do not need any of the other required materials. It's helpful to have as much um, as, as we can before the interview, just to provide some context around the student profile. But um, we know that some of these pieces are out of your control um, and it's, um, you know, it's just important to go ahead and get that um, admission interview scheduled on, you know, before the application deadline. And I'll get into the timeline in a minute. Um, so that interview is scheduled for one hour. I, roughly, we take about you know, 20 to 30 minutes to talk to the student um, and then about 20 to 30 minutes to follow up with the parent. And those can be done either in person or virtually. Great, so when do I apply? Um, we do recommend that people check our important dates website in September for the exact dates. Um, so we, um, you know, abide by the, the, um, you know, the guidelines set by our governing board AASGW in, in terms of some of our dates. So those will be set and published um, later in the summer or early fall. So please come back um, when those have been finalized, but this gives you a rough timeline for the admission cycle. So September 1st is when our Flint Hill admission application will open. Um, as I mentioned before, you, you should definitely go ahead with scheduling your admission interview, even if you haven't completed the questionnaires yet or, or submitted any of the other information. Um, we do use um, an, an easy scheduling tool um, for the admission interview. So go ahead and, and do that as soon as you can. Um, that is linked right in that Husky Hub um, profile, as I mentioned. Um, and so um, even if you're scheduling it for two, three, four, five weeks out. We'd rather it be on the calendar um, so you're not up against the time clock when, it, when you know, January is approaching. Um, of course, if your student is planning to take any admission tests, um, you can look at some of those dates, um, late September, early October, that might be scheduled for later in the fall or early winter. Um, you would, we would recommend that you wait until, um, you know, maybe mid-November to request the teacher recommendations just to give your student kind of ample time to get to know their students, get their teachers rather, and vice versa in the classroom, right? We don't want to um, have them asking their teachers on the first day of school for a recommendation. Um, you know, we want them to kind of establish that that relationship um, and, and give the teachers a little bit of time. Um, so we recommend waiting until November. Um, and that's when, you know, usually um, the first quarter has ended. So you can go ahead and move forward with requesting the um, transcripts from your students' uh, current school as well. Um, November 1st is also when our financial aid application opens. Um, for anyone who is interested in applying for financial aid, we'd certainly encourage you to do that um, as soon as possible. When we look into December, right before the winter holidays, um, your the, you know the majority of the application pieces should be submitted or scheduled or in process. So just kind of use that as a as a target deadline. Um, things happen very quickly once we return after the holidays and the new year, and then our admission um, application deadline is usually mid to late uh, January. Okay, um, as well as the financial aid deadline. So then the uh, admission committee takes um, February really to um, review and evaluate and discuss all of your, um, your students. Um, and we will release our admission decisions um, the first Friday in March is typically the date set by AASGW. Um, and then families are given about two weeks um, then to uh, accept um, our offer of admission or, or decline it um, and let us know. Um, 
in between that time where your admission uh, decision is released and when you need to let us know, we do have an event on campus um, called Revisit Day, where you get to come back um, onto campus and um, get your final questions answered, um, you know, just observe the community one last time. Um, it's a really fun day and exciting day because everyone who's here obviously has been um, admitted and we hope will enroll. Um, in terms of kind of next steps after enrollment, um, for the upper school in April, we have placement testing. Um, Mrs. Ayers talked a little bit about um, the process for um, course registration and, and placement. And so um, your students would come onto campus and take placement surveys in a couple different disciplines um, and then um, move forward with the course registration process a, a few weeks later. We also have a welcome celebration for families, um, you know, just to, to celebrate, um, you know, the, the enrollment um, and welcome them officially to our community. In May, um, we have an event called New Family Information Night. We actually just held it last Wednesday, um, which was really fun. Um, so this is where, uh, this is a parent only event where, um, you know, we really walk through kind of logistics and next steps. So what do you need to think about over the summer? Um, health forms, how to navigate the Husky Hub on the current parent um, side of things. Um, and just an opportunity to, to further connect with other um, new families and some current families. Um, and then in the summer, we'll have um, socials kind of scattered throughout the summer, not, not required in the least because we know people might be traveling, but again, opportunities to connect. Um, we really want to ensure that, um, you know, we're, we're supporting you all um, in this onboarding process and, and connecting you all with folks who can, again, um, answer questions and just put you at ease as you transition to a new school, which can be um, quite daunting. And then school starts um, the week after Labor Day, uh, the week before Labor Day, excuse me, uh, in August. Um, so some other ways to engage with our community um, events. So uh, today's virtual event is a great example. Thank you all for spending your mornings with us. Um, we do have some other events that we've recorded um, on our website. So feel free to access those at any time. Moving into the fall, we will have some um, virtual events as well as in-person events. So again, we encourage you to look back um, when those dates are, are solidified um, late summer, early fall, um, and register for, for some of those, especially at, at least one I would say that gets you onto campus, okay? Um, we also offer tours um, that can be done um, at any time. Um, we're finishing up, um, the, we have a couple more weeks of, of tours that we're offering through this school year, and then we'll pick them back up over the summer, although we always encourage folks to, um, if possible, you know, visit our um, you know, community when it's in action, when you can see students in classrooms, see teachers in action, um, and observe, you know, everyone kind of in their natural habitat. Um, phone consultations, so um, you're welcome to schedule those at any time with myself, my colleagues, uh, Justin Fitzgerald and Julie Lewis. We'd be happy to walk you through the process, answer any questions about Flint Hill, um, or perhaps a virtual meeting if you prefer this Google Meet um, virtual format. Um, we're also very active on social media, so we encourage you to check out, you know, our Instagram, our Facebook, our Twitter pages, and engage with the community um, in that way. One last opportunity that I didn't mention for applicants. So once your student has submitted that application um, in, in, in September, if you're really targeting the 2023-2024 school year, um, is a, a shadow visit. So um, we do require the application form to be submitted um, in order to do um, a, a visit on campus, but it's a really um, great opportunity for students to, again, observe our community in action, um, shadow a current student, visit a few classes, um, and engage um, in some social time during the day as well. It's, it's, a, it's a, a half day visit, so usually from about 8.15 until noon. Um, so it's a great opportunity for them to really get a feel as to whether or not, you know, they could see themselves um, at Flint Hill. Great. And for people that may be interested in applying for this upcoming school year, so the 2022-2023 school year, um, they should definitely email um, us or, or call us right away um, as there may be space depending on the student profile and how it fits into our current composition given our intentionality, okay? Um, the faster you get in touch with us, if you are interested in this upcoming school year for admission, um, the more possible it will be for your student. All right, I think that about covers it.
I'm going to let my colleagues, Julie and Justin, jump in if there's anything that I'm missing. And we did have a couple of people who joined um, the event late. Uh, we will be sending out um, a link to um, this um, event uh, via email this afternoon. So those of you who did arrive late, you will be able to view it and get all the information that was shared today. Thank you, Mr. Yes, Lewis. Uh, <clears throat> Lauren, it's, it's up to you. I can answer this or you can take it. But we did have a question in the chat uh, regarding the, you know, essentially the size of the incoming ninth grade class and the breakdown uh, to some degree between our uh, eighth grade students and um, students um, new to the new to Flint Hill coming in in high school. Sure. Great question. So typically we see that in, in, in our ninth grade enrollment that um, it's maybe about a 60-40 split between students coming from our eighth grade um, and students coming from um, other external programs like our, you know, our feeder schools, like Devin came from Nysmith and, and Soliana from West, Westminster, or like Grace coming from um, Cooper Middle School, a, a local public school. Of course, there are also families that are moving in from um, out of town um, who will join us as well. So it's a really nice mix um, in the ninth grade. All right. Well, again, thank you all for joining us this morning. Thank you again to uh, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Page, Mrs. Ayers, all of our panelists and my wonderful colleagues in the admission office. We look forward to working with your families, um, whether it be for this upcoming school year or for the following school year. Don't hesitate to reach out if you need anything. Take care. Thank you.